Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I enjoy, I enjoy it very much. I hope you will enjoy the, the talk, too. Okay, so I'm going to talk about minimal surfaces in S3. So it's an isotropic space. I know you like uh, non-isotropic space, but the ambient space is uh, very easy to work. Uh, not easy to work with, but isotropic in a way. So uh, this is done work with uh, the intro about these uh, new surfaces. And the, 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 the paper of Capulas and Young appeared uh, in April of this year in the American Journal of Mathematics. So, so th this is something to do with the uh, Yaw's conjecture. So the f I will explain a little bit to you uh, what all these terms are. Maybe you, I think most of you know, but maybe sometimes you don't know what it is. So uh, the first con uh, the conjecture mean is that the first eigenvalue of an embedded minimal surface of S3 is two. That's the uh, that's the conjecture. It's 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 still not known. And uh, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, we proved uh, with uh, Cho, we proved something uh, in this direction. I, anyway, uh, we proved something about the first eigenvalue of um, embedding in more surface, uh, which is the, the following thing. So if the surface has uh, sufficiently, uh, has uh, a lot of, uh, is invariant by a group of reflection, that has lots of symmetries, then you can say something if the, the fun, a fundamental domain of the surface is uh, simply connected as, as less than six, six edges. So it's a condition on the, on the, um, on the geometry of this domain, and I will explain to you later. So this is, this is the, the theorem we did, uh, when you to, uh, which appeared last year, uh, a year ago, right? And, um, so this gives the following result that all minimal surfaces that we know of are uh, satisfy this uh, this condition, this uh, result that that is the first eigenvalue is two. Okay. But at the same time, in, uh, appeared a paper in, in archive that uh, with a new minimal surface or a family of new minimal surfaces, which are the Capulas Young surfaces. So uh, we, we had to study this, these surfaces to know if they, uh, they could uh, satisfy this condition. And it turns out that they didn't. The, the fundamental piece of these surf the, the surfaces has exactly six edges. So we, cannot, we couldn't use our theorem. So what I'm going to talk about today is this, uh, this thing, that the first eigenvalue of these minimal surfaces, this family of new minimal surfaces is two. Okay. And uh, for M large, uh, there is something here written for M large. You should know that these surfaces are known only for M large. They are constructed in the asymptotic way. So we, we know the existence on wind when the genus is, is large. M has something to do with the genus for the surface. Okay, so I'd like to uh, introduce you to um, first to some models, uh, S3 models. So this this model, the, uh, the, the standard Euclidean sphere in R4, is very useful to compute things, but it's very hard to visualize. So we're going to use another model too at the same time. So let's remind let me remind you that S3 is just this uh, this uh, the set of uh, complex coordinates. You could see it this way, or for or uh, real coordinates that satisfy this. Okay, so you have to think about what are the line in S3. It's just intersection of vector plane in R4 with S3. So it's really easy to, to use. So it's, these are spherical lines. The, orthogon also the notion of orthogonal in R4 it gives um, a notion of duality for these lines. Because uh, when you have a vector plane, uh, in R4, there is another vector plane which is perpendicular, and uh, whose intersection with the first one is uh, just uh, the, or the origin. So for, for each line, you have another one, a dual, a dual, a dual, dual one. And uh, okay, so usually I will take these coordinates. 
So the first coordinates are, as you could think it of as a horizontal sphere, and then the other coordinate is a vertical, uh, a vertical sphere. So the distance between the two uh, spheres is pi over two for any point. On the one of the, uh, for any to I mean, the distance between the two lines is pi over two. So you can cut uh, S3 with a hyperplane, and then you got a plane, a spherical plane. Okay, and if you consider symmetries, usual symmetries, orthogonal symmetries with respect to H, and you look at the, uh, and you look at the restriction to uh, S3, oh, you see, <laughs> there's a problem, I'm going too fast, that this is S3, then th this defines a reflection with respect to S. So I'm going to use this reflection. Okay, so let me tell you that, so in this way it's very easy to work with, you see, the complex way is very nice. So this is C, this is C, and for instance, uh, when I write down something like this, this is the, the set of points that have uh, constant distance to zero. So it's S3, actually, right? And if I, I take, let's say, a complex vector plane, vector, uh, complex line, I mean. Actually, it's a real plane. So it's going, it's going to cut uh, S3 into a, uh, a line, a spherical line, which is particular because this is complex. And these lines are the half lines. So n not all the, li the lines are half lines, just the ones that are complex in a way. Okay, so in this, in this model, it's easy to, um, to compute, to write down the, the Clifford torus. Either in, uh, the, uh, y you parameterize it this way, so T and U uh, is any, uh, are any real number. Or you can write it algebraically too. And you could see it naturally, uh, geometrically. This is the set. Uh, uh, so uh, this is for computation, this domain, this uh, model. But I will use rather the, uh, the other model, the one R3 with a point at infinity, because uh, I want you to visualize some stuff. OK. So, uh, people always use this chart. No, I'm not going to talk about, uh, I think you know this. But this, this is the stereographic projection. This is a three. And these are three. And so you see uh, R, S3 as a R3 with a point added at infinity. So this is a conformal uh, map, but it's not, it's not a metric one. So sometimes distance are weird. So this is the metric. You see the metric is isotropic and uh, go, uh, goes down as you go away. So uh, for instance, if, if I write down the, the Clifford torus, which will be this, the main, one of the main uh, uh, character in the, in the talk. So this is, let's say, the, the T direction. So this is one axis. This is C. This is, let's say, C. No, C is, uh, sorry. This is C. In this model, this is C perp. And if I cut it this way, the, the, the Clifford torus is, uh, is uh, Clifford is uh, invariant by these rotations, which are symmetries. The rotations along Z, along Z, are symmetries from S3. Like this. The, the center is not here, it's somewhere there, because of this metric. So usually I will write down the Clifford torus this way when I use this model. Okay, so we need something else which is called the to uh, uh, toric coordinates. So toric coordinates is what you, what you think. You are interested in what's going on near the torus. So the torus, I said the torus like this. Do you see what I'm writing down on the backboard or do you have to switch off? Do you see? No? Okay, uh, sorry, contrary. <laughs> you see? Okay, so this is, uh, here you have uh, h, x, and y. So what is h? h is the distance with, with respect to the center. This is this, this line. So this is orthogonal. x uh, is the, uh, corresponds to the parallel, the parallel to, uh, on the torus, and y corresponds to the meridians. Okay, so the, when the distance here, the distance, from here to here is pi over 4. This is the Clifford torus. 
but you have a whole family of two lines when h varies. So we are going to use these coordinates. So in these coordinates, you see, this is a slab in R3. So now we are, we are going to work in R3, in a slab of R3, but with the metric, sometimes which is deduced, which is induced from the spherical metric. So we're going to work in R3 with a different metric. Okay, so that's, so now the torus, the torus is uh, using these toric coordinates. The torus is, uh, is equal, I would say, to a square, a flat square. And this, the lines, okay, these lines you know, these are the, the parallels the, and merid meridians, x and y. And these lines are interesting because, as you will see, this corresponds to half lines or half lines or other lines. All of these are called Villasso lines. So there are lines on the torus. So these torus have many, many, uh, many lines. And here the, the drawing is false because the intersection between these two lines for the before torus is pi over 2. If you take a tube which is less, then you'll see the lines do, doing this thing. So. And you see, I divided the square into, f into f here, four by four pieces. So it's going to be this div division has something to do with the, the uh, young, uh, the um, Capulas Young uh, surface. I'm going to put here, uh, think in terms of H, I'm to put here another, and then I'm going to put here catenoids. Okay, so a little bit of uh, what is uh, uh, reflection. So I will be interested in reflection that are, uh, oh, there are lots of mistake here. Reflection are written by vector planes, okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to consider um, a reflection group that is uh, generated by reflections, but uh, which is finite. So there are going to be four, uh, four generators, four planes. Okay, here is an example. You, you know, all, uh, think of this first in terms of the sphere. This, I mean, the sphere. So you see here I have lines. And these lines uh, divide the sphere into eight domains, right? Eight triangles. But now think in terms of a three. That is to say, a three here. So you see here now the domains are like this. So you may see a, a tetrahedron there. This one is a tetrahedron. And you've got, and this big sphere is actually a line. And when I will reflect what's inside the sphere, uh, outside, they're, they're going to be, S3 is going to be tessellated by exactly 8, uh, 8, 16 tetrahedra. Okay? So I'm going to tessellate S3. S, that is to say, S3 is going to be uh, divided into congruent, tetra, congruent tetrahedra. Okay, so what are all the surfaces known? No more surf embedded surfaces known. They are all here. They are not others. There are other ways people, there are two ways to construct uh, supposedly minimal surfaces, which is the pitts rubinstein way, but uh, according to uh, Robinstein is himself, there is some gap still to find. And there is now this uh, Capuas method, but, uh, which is used to construct this young mills, this young uh, Capuas young surfaces, which is a doubling of the surface, but not the signalization. So up to now, the only minimal, embedded minimal surfaces are here. For this one, as to you know, uh, the torus is clearly for torus. These are the Lawson surfaces. And this is what is called the Coxeter uh, right, uh, way of representing these groups. So these, all these points represent planes of symmetries. When, whenever, you put, if, whenever you put a line in between, it means that the angles of the plane equals pi over m. If there is no line, it means the angle is pi over 2. So here it means that any of these, uh, these two plane is perpendicular to these two. So this group here, because of this, 
is not is reductible. It's not it's, it's not irreductible. So this this is the uh, the um, the loss in surfaces. So here we should understand m minus one times four uh, k minus one. This is a genus. The problem is I don't have the place to write all this down. And this is the number of tetrahedra that divide S3. So these surfaces were constructed by Kasha, Pinkhal, and Sterling. It comes from the idea that uh, you can uh, tessellate S3 with platonic solids. The thing is, doing this, they forgot one surface, this one, because this one, uh, they forgot uh, yeah, a group, and so a surface, as you will see. And th so they, you should add this surface. Because this one doesn't correspond to a platonic solid. But still, it comes from it, it, it intessellates S3 into tetrahedra, and you can use exactly the same method that they did to, to construct a minimal surface. And this, are, it is, this is the, the, the minimal surface I'm going to talk about. And the group, the uh, uh, group, it has uh, the group of reflections. Uh, it is invariant by this group of reflections, but by all the all the uh, isometries, which are uh, how to say that, <coughs> you make symmetries along these uh, Villarceau lines, symmetries and gliding symmetries. So this is just a group of. Uh, I wrote down only the group of uh, symmetries of the surface, of the uh, reflections. Okay. So all these surfaces have these common properties. They are all gene variant. G means a reflection group. Their fundamental domain has four edges, and you'll see what it means. Even uh, except for the uh, Capulation example where it has six edges. Okay, there are two infinite families that converge respectively to bouquet of Steiner spheres or double, uh, or double torus. This is for the Lawson surfaces and this is for the Capulation surface. Okay, so th this is a, a picture of uh, Pinkard Sterling and uh, um, Karcher, Pinkard Sterling. This is the patch. This is a, a fundamental tetrahedron and this domain here is a minimal surface that is perpendicular to all these four spherical planes. And this tetrahedron is characterized by these angles. So you can think either in terms of groups or in terms of this tetrahedron. So you see here, is, this is an example of half uh, that, uh, what was called the tetrahedron surface. This, this sphere here is a line, so you have to reflect it to get the whole surface. And when you reflect it, you got this thing. This picture is in, uh, is in the conformal domain. That's why it budges a little bit, because of the conformal uh, representation. The metric is not uh, invariant. OK. So now, uh, what, what about the first eigenvalue? So everybody knows that if sigma is minimal in Rn, then the, 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 eigen the coordinates are harmonic. Minimal in S3 or in Sn, uh, so if, no, it's here you should put uh, R4, right? And it is two. If you put N, it's going to be N here. Okay. So this satisfies. These are the, uh, um, the uh, x1, x2, x3 are the coordinate functions. Okay. And even you can put x4, right? There are four coordinates. OK, so let me remind you that, uh, that this is the, what I call the first eigenvalue. Maybe we should say it's the second eigenvalue, because it's not constant. Turing 1 proved that this first eigenvalue should, uh, should be, uh, this, here this is 2, right? Should be bigger than 1. And uh, let me tell you that there are ways to lower the eigenvalue of delta. Either you increase the co-dimension, and you have this formula. So if you take a sphere that you, uh, the, uh, a sphere that you put in S n, you can put, uh, embed it minimally, and you have this formula. Where I, uh, here, all the spheres have radius 1. So the higher the co-dimension, co the lower the first eigenvalue. Now, see, here is an example. The only surface is for n equals uh, 4. And uh, there is another way to construct. So I, there is another Japanese who, who did this before. I forgot his name. Otsi, was it? That there are the example of uh, immersed minimal tori, which, which are rotational. 
and rotationally symmetric and which are but immersed, not embedded. And the thing is, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a torus but with a longer torus than it's, uh, than the, uh, instead of being a, qu a square, it's a rectangle, conformally speaking. Okay, so what, what is the, um, what are the, how, how do, you, what do they look like, these minimal surfaces? Okay. So first, the M, the parameterization, corresponds to the genus. Why? Because it's just you take a torus, another torus, and you add uh, M squared, you add M squared uh, catenoid, so the result is as genus M squared plus one. So that's the yeah, only reason. So I'm going to tell you how they construct it. So it's just an idea because it's, uh, the construction is uh, rather heavy in terms of PDE. So. But the idea is the, is the following. So first, you, you, you start, you're in the slab, actually. Just think in terms of the slab. And uh, so what you do is you're going to take, uh, you're going to construct, so the slab is like this. This is the, the torus the covering of the torus, and you take a neighborhood of this, uh, uh, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, Clifford torus. So as I told you before, suppose this is, this parameterizes the whole torus, so we divide it into m by m uh, pieces. And uh, in, 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 in you're going to put some, something that looks like this, catenoid and a square like this for each. So maybe I'm going to show you the picture right now. So you, you put the domain like this and you, you put it. This is a view on top. This is a view from the side. So it, yeah, I, I'll show you a picture. OK, so, so first, what's important is you're in a slab of R3 and you construct a surface and prime, which is a catenoid and a, a piece of plane, which is a piecewise smooth. Then the second thing you do is you smooth, because as you're going to see, it's, the, the surface is not smoothed, so you have to smooth it. So instead of being m prime, it's going to be m second. Then you change the metric. Instead of using the Euclidean metric, you're using the induced metric. But as you, as you, when you look at the induced metric, here it's flat. So near, but near the Clifford torus, it's almost the Euclidean metric in, the, in some way. Then what you do is, you deform, once you have a smooth surface, you deform it. And you deform it using, uh, trying to solve a PDE, which is where the construction, the, uh, the main co construction uh, happens. And this, this, section of the normal bundle of m second with the uh, spherical metric is going to be a minimal surface for the induced metric, that is to say for three. And it is invariant by the group of symmetries that is to see here, you see planes, vertical planes of symmetry, uh, translations, and all these symmetries here in Rn by the toric uh, coordinates function phi are going to be symmetries in S3. Okay, so this is the hard part to show this equation. Okay. So uh, let me remind me that uh, let me remind you that this is true only for m large. This is in a way asymptotic because they, to ex to have some kind of estimates, they need to get re uh, they need to take m very large. Okay, so here the, the piece of surface. So this is a, a, a view from the side, and this is a view from top. So there is a catenoid, and you glue it to a, what I call a square annulus. So, so this is flat, and you, you glue it here. Okay, so this is flat here, yeah, this is flat. Okay, so this is piecewise smooth. And these are the, uh, the height in terms of the m, which is a parameter, and the length. Okay. So once you have this, you, and the, okay, th so this is a bad picture of what happens in the, in the, um, 
in a fundamental tetrahedron. So you see here the piece of surface. It has exactly six edges. One, two, three, four, five, six. So this, this is the fundamental patch of the surface. It has six edges, and we cannot use our geometrical uh, argument. And this is a representation of, OK, it goes away. OK, so once we have this, so you think you may have an estimate. Now you say, oh, compute lambda 1. Maybe it's easy because well, I have two surfaces. I have a number of genus. So you, you may, you're going to compute a, a real equation of some good, of some, of some good function. Re, remi uh, let me remind you that lambda 1 is less than any. So you choose a good function f. So what you can take, uh, f equals 1 here, minus 1 here. So, and uh, it's symmetric, so the integral of f equals 0. This should be a condition. And now you can, and, uh, so here you put, you know that the height is going to be some epsilon. And you make the computation of this function, of, of this. So here, if you, if you do the thing uh, not carefully, that is to say first, you think, OK, I, I take a cylinder of, uh, of waist delta and height tau, uh, of height this, tau times m squared. Uh, I can estimate this. So this is going to be to the number of uh, catenoids. Because you see, gradient of f equals 0 here, 0 here, and it's 1 over S, uh, epsilon here. So you're going to have something like 1 over epsilon squared, the number of catenoid you add, the area of each catenoid times two times the area of uh, this Clifford torus, which is uh, 2 pi squared, right? 2 pi squared, okay. But if you, okay, if you replace this with a cylinder, you're very happy because it tends to 1. So you, ah, you see, ha, ah, this is, might be a good example. But actually, when you look carefully, when, when m goes to 0, this doesn't look like it's going to be a cylinder. Actually, it's going to be uh, smaller and smaller. It, it's more like it's going to be, the area is going to be two times this thing here. And when you replace this by this other approximation here, you, you, obtain, uh, you obtain something which is big. So no way it's, uh, it, it, goes, it, it, it goes even to plus infinity. So this is, the computation is are going to be uh, real needed in the sense that we have to estimate uh, what part of the surface, what, what, what is the area here? What happens when tau goes to zero, when n goes to infinity? So we have to compute stuff, and this is the, not the nice part, actually. Okay. So, okay, is it, is it clear? Or, yeah? Okay, so first, what do they do? They, we have to know the, which, la, which slab are we going to take. The slab has some height, height which is uh, given in terms of this m. So, so we consider a, a small neighborhood of the Clifford torus in terms of m. So the height around this uh, torus. Oh, I represent it in uh, so you, we take a we take a neighborhood a tube around this this is uh, this is given in terms of m and the corresponding slab is going to be going to be given in terms of m2 so this is the height and now what you do is I, so here you know uh, I need to change the metric. So uh, remember, phi is the toric coordinate function uh, map. So you, you, you do just computation on what you uh, What you see is actually the metric, uh, the spherical metric is given in terms of the Euclid metric this way. So you could see it's uh, h goes to zero, is going to be go to zero. So it's, so it's, it's like a perturbation of the Euclidean metric around them. So this makes compu computation easy. I speak. Okay. Okay, so now 
we would like to see if there is some connection between the first eigenvalue of the whole surface and the first eigenvalue of the patch. That is to say, the first eigenvalue in terms of free boundary uh, data. So uh, this is not clear that there is, uh, you can relate the two of them. So the trick here is to, as we, we've, we've been doing in the former paper, is to notice uh, the following. So you take, uh, you take uh, embedded mineral surface invariant by uh, reflection symmetry groups and any age class of function, whatever. So the I represents the Rayleigh quotient. So the first part is not very interesting for us, but the second part is very interesting for us. Suppose that the first eigenvalue is less than two, strictly less than two. So we're trying to understand what are these surfaces. So suppose they are less than two. Then the first eigenfunction is symmetric with respect to G. So in this case, you can reduce the problem of finding the first eigenvalue of or estimating the, eigen, the first eigenvalue of the whole surface in terms of estimating the first eigenvalue on, of, the, of the, uh, the fundamental uh, domain of this uh, thing, of the surface. Here I'm in S3, right? The surface is invariant. It has uh, some fundamental domain. So we can compute, estimate the lambda 1 of, of the whole surface in terms of the lambda 1 of the domain. Okay, I'm not. Okay, so if lambda 1 of them is less than 2, then computation is reduced to this uh, lambda 1 of the patch. Lambda 1 in terms, I repeat, in terms of the boundary, free boundary data. So that's, that's the key, one of the key ideas. So now, the surface is assumed to, to have lambda 1 less than 2. If it has lambda 1 equals to 2, then we are done. It's not interesting. Okay? So we, that's why not. Now, in the whole process, there's lots of deformation of metrics and surfaces. So we change the surface, we change the metric. So we have to estimate how, is, how the, uh, does the metric change according to, how does the first eigenvalue change in terms of the metric? So, I, I show, here I show you, for instance, for step three, which is I change the metric. I, 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 go, I go from the Euclidean metric to the spherical metric. Okay. Okay, so first there is some kind of uh, trick, because the surface has lots of symmetries, more than what I said. And in particular, it has some symmetry with respect, some kind of symmetry. Uh, actually, the surface in R3 had constructed M prime N has symmetry, as a symmetry with respect to the, to the horizontal plane. So instead of, uh, in, uh, I don't know where the picture is, up. So instead of working on the ho on on this piece, on this piece, I can it. instead of working on this piece, the whole piece, I can take half of it. So I cut it here uh, around the waist, and then I have some kind. I have to decide whether it's going to be uh, uh, here zero Dirichlet condition zero or normal condition. Uh, actually, because of the symmetry, you can show that either it is zero or it is uh, uh, normal condition. And further computations or show you that you can reduce the problem to here directly condition to the half to the half p. I call I call it p plus. And so here you take this domain and you cut it here. Here we look into uh, lambda one with zero here and free boundary away from uh, on the other side on the other component uh, the boundary. Okay. And now we have to estimate the variation of this when we change the metric. So actually, I did some, uh, uh, how do you say that, um, uh, the basic computation. But there is a result, a more general result, I didn't know before, uh, from uh, Wakawa and Bando, which covers this. 
and the eigenvalue of uh, on the eigenvalues of uh, of, of uh, uh, domains how it changes according to the metric. So uh, uh, so you can use you can do it by hand. So for example, you take this type of metric, and these are the real equations of the metric. So you see, it's not very hard to show that you can uh, uh, bound from below and above one of the one of the Rayleigh really quotient with respect to the others. That's uh, okay. C is a f C is a function. So this is a function. This is a function. So you have to control this function C naturally. It's near one. But what, what is the normal epsilon? What is the what? What is the normal epsilon? This is less than one. Norm of epsilon. This is a matrix, right? This is, this is the, 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 the this is a matrix, I mean. This is the matrix I wrote before. Uh, Oh, here it is. This is this. And H is small with respect to M. But this is gen general. I mean, if you have such a thing, okay, you, you change. I, I see the, the, the metric as a matrix. You can see it as a matrix. So you have this. Uh, well, saying that if you change, which is natural, if you change a little bit, uh, by a small amount of metric, then the lambda one is not going to change uh, drastically. Okay, but you have to write it down. And, uh. So we know we have this kind of uh, estimates for the lambda one. Okay, so I remind you that now I'm, I'm on a, a, a domain with boundary, and the problem is uh, normal condition on the on the square parts and uh, directly condition on the on the waste. And now there's going to be a series of uh, estimates, um, which happens when I change when I go from one surface to the other. So here, uh, here I need these estimates, and you see that the coefficients here is going to depend on m in one over m squared, whatever c is here. It's, c is not important, and so this is. Uh, this is the. Uh, this is. Uh, I, I take it fourth because, actually, I, I, my surface has this type of shape. But I take a fourth part of it, symmetry. I take this. So four and plus. It's because it's on top. So so this is uh, the the real minimal surface, and this is. Uh, this is the the surface, the smooth surface you started with without deforming it. So this one is not minimal. This one is minimal or a minimal piece. So, and you got, you, you do the same thing when you have, you, you replace it by uh, this not sp smooth piece. So here you see this is not smooth, but when you think about it, it's not important. This is, uh, the the uh, quotient is well defined if you have uh, a piecewise, uh, piecewise stuff. And then the metric is okay and there's no, there's no problem for that. Okay, so using this and this, you can estimate the, during the whole process, you can control the first eigenvalue. Okay. Okay, so, so now this is more technical. So uh, how, do, how you do this? So for instead of, so you have a piece of catenoid and you have a piece of uh, square, uh, square annulus. So what you do is, First, you take a bigger catenoid, and you're going to compare it. So uh, actually, the important thing is you're going to parametrize by a domain, which all these surfaces are going to be parametrized by a domain, flat domain, or M. And uh, you have to parametrize this and this and the compute in this flat domain with the induced metric. So this is the way you do it. Okay. And uh, you get this result first. So delta, right well, here, OK, I explain it to you something. One is co correspond to this catenoid, the one you started with. So here, I'm, I'm estimating the surface in the flat. I'm estimating this piece in the slab, flat, and not, uh, not smooth. 
So I, instead of taking this piece union with this piece, I consider a bigger catenoid. You may, how, how bigger this is given by this term? Delta is not important here. This delta is going to disappear. So you obtain this by computation. And then, this is more technical, that is to say now you have, you have to estimate the lambda 1 of this piece and the lambda 1 of this thing, or Rayleigh equation I would rather say, here and here. And then what you do is you consider the Rayleigh equation on the whole surface. So you have to be careful, uh, you have to uh, give an upper bound here and a lower bound here doing this. Because you have two pieces, you, you put them together, and you want to, co to estimate this. So I'm going to find, I have to find a, an upper bound here and a lower bound here. But you can do it. So you found this and here and the other way around here. The computation gives you this. Okay? Okay, so... So this was... First, wait, uh, this is for... Um, Okay, so here you compare the flat square annulus and the catenoid annulus. This is the bigger one minus this one. So actually, I constructed a bigger catenoid. A little bigger. And, and, and I, con I considered, I compared this piece with the flat stuff. So this, this lemma gives you how these, uh, the Rayleigh equation here, and the, uh, actually these terms first, are uh, related. So this has something to do, yeah. I com I'm comparing what I call the an catedonia annulus, this part, and the square annulus, this. And computation give this. Now here, and then I, what I do, oh, I forgot to erase this. Now, I compare these two parts, this one and the piece here. So, I got this. Okay. So, we f finally, so here what we do is we put, we put together this and this, and we compute the Rayleigh equation of the union of these two Dijon stuff. There again, trying to, exp to uh, up, uh, give an, uh, an upper bound here and a lower bound here. And so what we obtain is this formula. And so finally this gives this. Here the constant comes from, uh, in a way, I go from an annulus which is, I go from an annulus which is round here with uh, round circles and here square. So there is some kind of constant. I'm just, in, uh, I'm just uh, interested in upper bounds. So because you go from the square, fr uh, from the square to the, to the round, uh, uh, from a square annulus to a round annulus, you have some kind of constant coming in. But this is rough. So what I get is the following thing at the end. Okay. So as you see before, uh, all these terms. Uh, here it is not clear, but okay. Here, I have a term which is small in terms of one over m squared, so I cannot estimate this. It's uh, too complicated. So what I know is some asymptotic. I know for m large, there's going to be something plus uh, some minus something, whatever. Okay. So now, so now the conclusion is, once you've done this, you go back to, it's a, to, to sum up. So we, we suppose that the surface is strictly less than 2. And uh, then if you suppose this, then you know that the surface, the first eigenfunction is invariant by the group of reflections. So now, a GM invariant eigenfunction is a solution of the mixed boundary data problem on pre -prime. So you're now, you're now, uh, you go down, you, how do you say that, you are, um, you reduce the, the case to the study of this domain with boundary data. 
And now you estimate this domain. And uh, what you obtain is, as I showed you before, you see, this is bigger than 2. So this tells you that this stuff is bigger than 2. And so the fundamental piece of the surface is going to be bigger than 2. But this is impossible because we know this is for any minimal surface. We know that the first eigenvalue is less than less or equal to two. Why? Because the the, the uh, coordinate function gives you examples of uh, uh, eigenfunction with uh, eigenvalue two. So we you know that if you suppose that the surface uh, is is invariant, the eigenfunction is invariant by the group, then it has to be big. It has to be large, which is impossible. So this gives a contradiction. So we started with something which is wrong. So for m large, the first eigenvalue is necessary. For m large, the first eigenvalue of these uh, Kapulasian surfaces is 2. OK, so these are the papers. Uh, that is the paper I was talking about. Uh, and I forgot the title. So it appeared uh, this year. OK. Uh, I'm finished.